good morning, good evening, good night to everyone. Welcome to our, I think, 22nd CRM Camp um, seminar. It's a pleasure today to welcome Ferenc Barata from uh, Tseket in, in Hungary. Uh, so Ferenc Barata obtained his uh, master thesis, uh, I mean, his master from the University of Tseget in 2008 under the supervision of Thibaut Christin, who is present uh, among the participants today. And during his master, he worked on uh, Morse decompositions for state dependent delay equations. And then he did his PhD um, in Norway at the University of Bergen with Warwick Tucker. And he was there for uh, five years working on rigorous numerics. And his thesis was on computer aided proofs and algorithms and analysis. And he worked specifically on PDEs and delayed, uh, delayed equations. And after that, he went for a postdoc at Rice University uh, in Houston in 2014. He was working with Valid Taha on rigorous numerics for hib hybrid systems, and then with Krishna Palem on adaptive and approximating computing. And since 2017, he's been working at the University of Tseket with Gergely Rost and Tibor Christine on delay equations, population, and epidemics dynamics. And today, uh, it's my pleasure to have him speaking about periodic orbits in the Mackey glass equation. Please, Ferenc, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, for the opportunity to speak here. So the title of the talk is Stable Periodic Orbits for the Mackey glass equation. And this is a joint work with uh, Tibor Christine, Gabriel Lavash, Alexandra Vig. And yeah, Tibor is present here as well. So hopefully he might help me if there are some difficult questions. So let's see. So first, I, I'd like to recap what the Mackey glass equation is for those who are not so familiar with that one. So this is the delay differential equation. The delay is, uh, I don't know, can you see my pointer actually? Or? Yeah. OK, so yeah, that, so the delay delay uh, is coming from this part. You see tau is, uh, is a positive number. So basically, the, the derivative of the solution of, of this differential equation depends on the past of the solution itself. And uh, yeah, so we have two, two other parameters, A and B, they are positive numbers. And also this, this power N is, uh, it, it can change. And so this equation was proposed in 1977 by Michael Mackey and Leon Glass. And they used it as a model for feedback control for blood cells. This was a publication in Science. All right, so this is a, this is a very well-known delay differential equation. It, it has been uh, studied a lot. And just let's get rid of this delay uh, immediately, all right? So before it was a delay tau, and you know, if it, we all know, I guess, that we can just rescale the equation, and then we get uh, the delay to be one. Of course, the parameters a and b could change, but it's enough to to consider such equation. Okay, and let's take a closer look at this nonlinearity, right? So this delay term is actually encapsulated in this nonlinear function or nonlinear function with, uh, parameterized by n. This is a unimodal, and you could also say it's a hum function. So I just plotted uh, how this nonlinearity looks like for various values of n. Right, so it has it has one uh, distinct uh, maximum point and then one inflection point somewhere somewhere around here. So this, this is rather simple, okay. And let's see what can we tell about the solutions of this uh, Mackey glass equation. So I, I denote it by mg dash n. So this is the Mackey glass equation where the parameter is n. Right, so the phase space, as usual for delay equations, delay equations with constant delay one, we choose the, choose the phase space to be continuous functions on minus one to zero. And uh, now we can restrict ourselves to, to functions that take values, that take positive values only. So this is C plus, that's our phase space. And this is just the usual thing uh, for every delay equation that uh, if we start from an initial segment in our phase space, then we have to establish that there is a unique solution. And here's the unique solution X phi. This uh, phi stands for the initial segment. So we start from this initial segment phi, and then we let the dynamical system to do its work. So basically we have existence of solutions over all real numbers greater than minus one. The values of, of, uh, of these those solutions are positive. 
And I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with this notation. So when we put the time into a lower index, lower sub-index, subscript, okay, then we are talking about a certain segment of, of the solution. So here I, with, with these dashed lines, if you look at this segment and you consider this point as time t, then when I talk about x uh, sub t, then basically I consider this segment of the function scale back to minus one zero, right? So basically these segments, they are always inside our phase space. That is C plus. Okay, so um, maybe a, a simple, simple situation when uh, when the parameter a is larger than b, and of course both of them are larger than zero. I just plotted uh, plotted how a x versus the nonlinearity of x uh, it looks like, and so in in such cases the all solutions, no matter what initial condition we take, all solutions they will tend to zero. So this is this is quite simple. We are in a, it's more interesting when, uh, when the other parameter, so the, the parameter multiplying the delay term, B is larger than A, right? And these uh, curves, they will have an intersection, right? And when you think about that intersection, this, uh, this will result in the existence of a unique stationary point for the Mackey-Glass equation, right? So when B is larger than A, then we have a unique stationary solution. You can see here that the stationary point it means that there is a stationary point in the phase space. So basically there is a segment uh, over minus one to zero that is not changing. And this segment is actually a constant function, right? So it's not just a point, but it, we are always thinking about uh, segments, function segments. Okay, that's our phase space. Ferenc? Yeah? No, don't, you need, don't you mean a, a unique non-trivial stationary point? Because zero yeah, is non -trivial, yeah, zero, yeah. zero is of course, yeah. Uh -huh. So that's the that's non-trivial one. Yeah, that's what I meant, thank you. And uh, so this, this uh, non-zero stationary point is unstable for large, uh, large ends. And we also know that uh, there exists a compact uh, non-empty global attractor in the phase space. And we are trying to get some information about this uh, global attractor. Okay, so just, some information, some ideas what what what, what uh, are happening here. So this is this is the the point corresponding to the stationary point. And you see there is a, on this unimodal function, it has a there is like a different value of x at which the unimodal function is uh, taking the same value as the stationary point. And basically, one can show that the interesting dynamics it always happens uh, to the left, not to the right. Uh, from this from this critical value, so basically the global attractor will somehow the function segments in the global attractor will take values uh, somehow from this region. Okay, this is a region of negative feedback as well, and there are many results uh, about um, in general such equations. Like I I haven't written them on the slides, but um, I think I should mention that uh, we can apply the poincare van Nixon type theorem from Malé-Paré and Cell. We're also Gergely, uh, Eduardo Liz and Gu, they have results for such negative feedback regions, somehow bounding the, where the global attractor can, uh, can stay. Or maybe just one more, uh, one more work I'd like to mention as uh, Tibor is here. It's uh, the monograph by Christine Walter and Wu that somehow describing us uh, the structure of this uh, global attractor. Okay, so we know that there is a, uh, non-trivial, uh, unstable stationary point. And we know that there is a global attractor and basically we will be interested in finding periodic orbits inside A. Okay, so first let's consider uh, what happens if we keep increasing M, so N goes to infinity, right? What happens with the nonlinearity? This is, this is like the limiting function of uh, Fn's. I think I have a picture for that. So maybe the picture is always better than the formula, right? So as n goes to infinity, you see n is five, 10 and 20. These humps are getting larger and larger. And uh, basically the limiting function is the identity on zero, one and uh, zero for one and uh, larger values. Okay, and that is a critical point. Like at one, we define it to be one over a half. Okay, and, and there is an important feature of this convergence that it's uniform if we are away from one, right? If we if uniformly bound ourselves away from this point one, then this convergence is uniform. That's very useful 
that will come useful later. Okay, so what happens with the equation itself, right? We just replace fm by their limit with this discontinuous function, discontinuous nonlinearity. And we have these obvious questions like what's the connection between solutions of the original Mackey glass equation for large n? Or more precisely, we are interested in periodic solutions. Uh, what is the connection between periodic solutions of the original Mackey glass equation for large n and this? let's say limiting the so-called limiting Maclias equation, right? So basically, I don't think I have the Maclias here anymore. Okay, so I just want to emphasize that we let n uh, go to infinity and then basically we, we, we gain something because this function is, is much nicer than the, than the original nonlinearity, right? That has the, that was, I think I have it here, right? That's psi divided by one plus psi to the power of n. So this is this is a this is much nicer, right? This is just identity for uh, for values smaller than one, and then zero later. But on the other hand, we are losing something because now the nonlinearity is discontinuous. Okay, so that will have that will affect the smoothness of our solutions. All right. Let's see what connection we can establish between between the general Mackey glass equation and, and this limiting version. Okay, yeah, exactly as I mentioned, so the nonlinearity is discontinuous. That's why we are losing smoothness, right? The, the solutions, I will define the solutions a bit later, but they, they are still continuous, but uh, they are not continuously differentiable in general. And uh, I just like to mention uh, that for, how to say it, nice delay differential equations, there is a very uh, pleasant property of such equations that uh, the solutions are getting smoother and smoother. There is a smoothing effect. So when I'm when we are advancing with the delay interval, when the delay interval in our case is one, so if we are increasing time uh, one by one, then actually the the level of smoothness increases. But not in not in this case. But if we just dig in a bit closer to the, to the structure of this equation, we see that based on the value of the delay term, right? This is the delay term x t minus one. So if it's smaller than one, then we have this very simple and familiar uh, linear delay differential equation. And if the delay term is larger than one, actually, then we have an ODE, right? So, but, so the big picture is that this is a discontinuous nonlinearity, but in fact, um, it's, it's rather nice if we can just separate parts of the solutions where it's larger than one and where it's smaller than one. So actually, instead of saying we are losing smoothness, I would say we have piecewise smoothness for the solutions. Okay. So let's see what the solution of this uh, limiting Mackey-Glass equation is. So this is a function on minus one to infinity. It will take positive uh, values, right? And it's, it's satisfying this integral equation for any tau. Uh, larger than zero and less than t. So this is basically the definition of, uh, of a solution. And it turns out that in order to define unique solutions, we need to restrict uh, the phase space. Just recall that the original phase space was the con positive continuous functions on minus one to zero. That was this C plus. So instead of C plus, we go into a subset. And this subset is such that uh, each value uh, each value is taken at finitely many points only, right? So um, this is the inverse of this uh, of this segment, and basically for any c real value, positive real value, right? Uh, original points, s points in minus one zero that result in uh, phi being c, the number is only finite. Okay, so this is just a technical thing, and now if we just go into this sub, uh, subspace and we call it our phase space, then existence and uniqueness will be guaranteed within this phase space. Okay, so now we have solutions. And uh, let's see what these solutions uh, need to, how, how they need to behave. So there is this critical point. If you think what, what the, I think I go back uh, just for a second. So this one A divided by B, what's this point? I think I have the, Maclean's equation in the limit here. So imagine that x x of t is one, 
and this uh, x of t minus one is uh, a divided by b, right? And b is larger than a. So the argument of the f function is smaller than one, then f is just the identity. So basically I have zero here, right? So exactly at this point, which I'm, uh, which I'm highlighting here, the derivative would be zero, right? So these points are critical. It turns out that they are critical and uh, we'd like the solution to avoid this point and actually not just this point, but actually a, a whole region surrounding this point. So if we define this, uh, this neighborhoods, neighborhoods with bit of uh, delta zero, then somehow we'd like, we are looking for solutions that are never entering uh, such neighborhoods or some delta zero that will come later. And some additional uh, property that we need is the, that the delay term when we, when we are looking at the, at the solution on a compact interval, I forgot to mention that. So now we are working on a compact interval. So when we are looking at the delay term, we somehow would like to limit how many times um, the delay for uh, will take one of these values, one and then some of values on the boundary of this, of this term here. Right, so somehow all, all these, uh, all these considerations are to, are to, how to say, distance the solution from this critical point. So if we somehow manage to do that, then actually we may bound for how long the solution stays close to one. And one, if you remember, one is the point where the function, when the nonlinearity is discontinuous. And also if we, if we can somehow establish that we are not staying close to this uh, point of discontinuity, then due to the uniform convergence away from one, we, we have some chance to, to establish a connection between solutions of the original Mackey-Glass equation and of the limiting one. So basically, I think, I think the, the important point here is, is the last sentence that, uh, that uh, we'd like the solution to stay away from one or when it clo get close to one, then it, then it only stays there only for a short time. Basically, these uh, considerations will help us do that. Okay, so let's see, here's a theorem. This will not be pleasing to the eye, okay? But this is my only, only such slide, so, so please bear with me. Okay, so we are taking an initial function from this new phase space, right? This is the positive continuous functions on minus one zero where the inverse of any value is, is finite. It's just finitely many points. We take an integer and larger than one. We need some constants, gamma zero and delta zero. Delta zero is as before. That's basically giving us this neighborhood around the critical point that we'd like to avoid. And our first condition is exactly that, that the solution, right? This is the solution and this is the delay term. So when I'm saying it's avoiding this region, this is what I mean the, in the xt, xt minus one uh, phase plot, this point never enters this uh, neighborhood of the critical point, right? So we are on this compact interval and we are avoiding this neighborhood of the critical point. And our second condition is it, it's, a, it's a bit technical. I try to phrase it in English, maybe it's more understandable. This is, this is about the delay term, uh, just a bit too many indices here. But somehow we are controlling, we are controlling by this new constant gamma zero. We are controlling uniformly uh, that uh, the delay term, how many times the delay term can take one of these values, one of these three values, right? So this is one and, and the boundary from this, uh, from this n delta zero. Okay, so the only point here is that we need a uniform bound and I will not use this gamma zero in, in what follows because I have not uh, written up the, the formulas for these constants. But the point is that now we can construct, we can actually construct this uh, capital B larger than zero. We can also construct the delta one larger than zero. And um, we also have a mapping that for a delta, uh, it will give us a, an integer number, positive integer number. This mapping actually, before I finish my sentence, I just cut in. So this mapping is, is somehow, it stands for this uniform convergence of the of the delay term of the nonlinearity, and that, that's where this n comes from, such that if I take a small delta, okay, so basically here, like two, oh, it's, I think it's too much, too much, too much happened at once. Maybe I, I try to just uh, 
state what this what this equation is saying here. So this part is the solution of the limiting Mackie-Glass equation from an initial condition, initial segment phi. And the other guy here is uh, n and psi. This is a solution of the original Mackie-Glass equation with a certain uh, um, parameter n and with an initial segment psi. Right. So these are solutions of different delay differential equations. And you see that the subscript is uniformly one. It means that I'm looking at these solutions on the interval zero to one, right? It's always a subscript and we go back one in time. So this is, these are the solutions on uh, zero to one. And the difference of these solutions, normal, the difference of these solutions is small. It's smaller than a certain delta. Then actually we can bound the difference of the solutions for a longer time, basically on this compact interval, actually a bit, uh, even a bit longer from zero to n plus one. So remember m was a integer, large integer. Okay, so we have this very simple estimate and you see that if delta is going to zero, then basically this b is a, b is a constant, which is independent of delta, m was also fixed. So what it means here that if the initial if initially the solutions of the limiting equation and the original equation for a large n, here's a large n. And so if for large n, uh, they, are, they are close, then they will stay close over any compact interval. That's stated here as well. So once more, if the solutions are close initially, then they will be close uh, over zero to zero m or zero m plus one. Okay, so this is important because this somehow establishes the connection and this tells us that it might be just enough to look at the limiting equation and derive some knowledge for the original Mackie-Glass equation for large n. Okay, so one problem here is that n large, this is not, we are not being precise here. All the results uh, which I will establish here, they are valid for large n and we don't know what that means. It can be very large or not so large. And, and also, what's the value of b in general? Is it way larger than one, or it's smaller? I mean, I don't know. I would say it's definitely larger than one. This this is just a how to say this is just a theory backing backing the connection. Okay. Okay. So b, b is a function of this uh, in the second kind the number of crossings of these uh, uh, critical values one. A over B plus delta zero and so on. So this yeah, it's a function of gamma zero. It can be given explicitly. Okay, so say, say for the periodic orbit that you're proving, what's this number B? I think it depends on the periodic orbit because the number of crossings is uh, can be can be quite different. I know, I know, but say for the one that you have proven, for the for the one that you're interested in, say, do you, do you have any idea of what that number is? Honestly, I haven't computed it. Okay. All right, so let's see what's next. Uh, so just one, uh, one final thing, uh, what kind of periodic solutions will be, uh, we will be looking for. So we will be looking for periodic solutions of the limiting Mackie-Glass equation. Okay, and we are looking for a certain kind that starts, uh, that those solutions will start above one. What does that mean? That uh, P is a periodic solution and originally on minus one to zero, it's actually larger than one and exactly at zero, it equals to one. Uh, yeah, equals to one, right? So basically you can imagine that this is a function that's coming down and doing something about, about one and exactly at zero when we start and we really start our solution, it takes the value one. Okay, and of course we need that uh, this periodic solution, it has to avoid this critical point on uh, A divided by B. And we have this omega, which is the minimal period. Okay, so I'm simplifying here a lot, but basically when n is large, we have, then we can establish that when n is large, the original Mackie-Glass equation has a stable periodic solution Pn with a minimal period omega n, and it's true that uh, Pn tends to P and omega n tends to omega as n tends to infinity. All right, so this is establishing the connection that if we find the periodic orbit for the limiting Mackie-Glass equation that starts above one, then we can infer that for large n's, the original equation has a somewhat similar uh, periodic solution. 
Okay, so let's see what can we tell about periodic solutions for the limiting Mackey-Glass equation. This is where rigorous numerics will, uh, will kick in. So uh, here uh, I'd like to mention- Lorenz, I'm sorry, there is a question in the chat by Piotr. I don't know if you see your chat. Uh, how, to, how, to, how to check the chat? Anyway, the question is, why is it stable? Why is the periodic orbit stable? So we are looking for stable periodic uh, periodic orbits. Actually, we have a. Um, so it, it it will be obvious from the numerics that uh, that uh, we can only find uh, stable or uh, stable periodic orbits this way. Uh, actually, we are we are also working with Gabriela and, and Tibor on uh, finding unstable uh, periodic solutions, and I think we have, we made a good progress on that. But you know, this, in this case, we were just considering stable ones. So I would come here and actually I just wanted to mention Piotr. Uh, again, I, I did not put the reference on the slide that uh, now we are doing, we will be basically doing forward time integration for this uh, delayed Mackey-Glass equation, limiting Mackey-Glass equation. And I have, I have to mention that uh, Piotr and, uh, and his student Robert Shalina, they made some great work on rigorous numerics for um, delay differential equations with constant delay. I have not tried, we have not tried to apply um, their, let's say, software for this uh, limiting equation, but for one reason, because, because now the nonlinearity is discontinuous. Of course, this, this is basically we just need to find crossings of one, right? Because the discontinuity happens when, when the solution crosses one. Um, but, but Somehow we, we can we can leverage the, the specific uh, specific structure of the solution here, and I feel that oh no something happened here. Chat. Okay, the word just took that. Uh, so we can leverage on the on the structure of the solutions here, and and uh, I believe that uh, that we are better off with doing a specific solution for this case. Okay, so let's see let's see how how a solution of the limiting Maclear equation looks like. So right, we start above one. That means that uh, the initial segment phi s is larger than one for negative values, and it's one at zero. Okay, so it's straightforward that on the next time interval, that is from zero to one, the solution is just uh, exponential. It's just an exponential decay, e to the power of minus at. And I put, I made it a bit more complicated than it's necessary. So this is the solution on, on zero to one. But I just somehow like to emphasize that this could be considered as a polynomial of, uh, of t, or maybe more importantly, as a polynomial of pt. And what happens on the, if you advance time by one more, right? So this is t is going from zero to one, and I'm looking at the solution from one plus t. That is basically, I'm looking at the solution on, on one and two, one, between one and two. Okay, so you see that the solution is again an exponential decay multiplied with, and now I say it, a polynomial of uh, b times t. So this is basically this, this one here is the same one as appeared one time delay before. Somehow this guy is shifted from zeroth order coefficient to the first order coefficient, and we have a new, uh, new constant coefficient in this polynomial. So now let's look at it be uh, in a more general setting. Okay, so we start, the solution now has a segment that is above one and it's not on a time interval of length one, but on a certain time interval, we don't know how long this is between tau one and tau two. Okay, actually maybe it's, it's a good idea to rewrite this. So these two things are the, are the same. Okay, so instead of letting T run from tau one to tau two, we can go into local time. I call it local time or local coordinates. And t is uh, just running from zero to the length of this of this small interval that we are looking at. Okay, so this is just reparameterizing the solution. And then we see that one time later, look here. So this is this is one time later, right? Tau one plus one instead of instead of just tau one. Okay, I'm clicking clicking too much. So one time later, uh, the solution is an exponential, exponential decay. Of course, we need some initial condition for that. This is just the initial condition. That's the 
actual value of the solution at uh, at one time unit later, and then it's an exponential decay e to the power of minus eighty. Yeah. Okay. So let's see what happens if we are if the solution is not greater than one. It was not greater than one in the past. Okay. Now we assume that it the solution was uh, described by a specific structure. That's the exponential decay multiplied with this polynomial. And as I forecasted, it's a it's a polynomial of uh, basically bt b times t. Okay, it's, it's written in this, uh, this way for a very specific reason, you will see shortly. Okay, so if we, again, if we advance one unit in time, then we see that these coefficients of the polynomial, they are preserved. They are a bit shifted though, right? So here the n has been increased by one. So the order of, uh, of, the, of the polynomial is, is uh, one larger than before. And the new constant, uh, the, uh, the, the new coefficient is the constant term in the polynomial. And that's always just the initial value of the solution at the beginning of this new time segment in the future. Okay, so I go back quickly just to this slide to see that this happened here as well, right? So this one here, this is basically all the, all the coefficients that I have right now, and they are shifted to higher powers of Bt, right? So one is shifted higher powers of bt and then the new constant value is being added here so this is exactly what happens here all these coefficients are, are shifted by one and a new constant uh, term is added and maybe we can just summarize it like this that we have we can represent the solution in the future again as an exponential decay multiplied by a polynomial of bt and uh, the coefficients of this uh, of this polynomial are pretty simple they are the old coefficients plus a new guy uh, comes in. That's the initial value of the solution at the very beginning. Okay. So based on what we have seen so far, what can we tell about the solution of the limiting Maclaurin equation? So it, it will be piecewise smooth. Okay. And over each interval of smoothness, we may describe the solution as this exponential decay multiplied with a certain polynomial. And we can do this description in local time. Right, so if we go into this local coordinate span, S is always running from, uh, from zero to the length of the interval, then we have this nice structure and yeah, and T is some polynomial. And the final thing we need to take care of, these are the crossings of one. So right now imagine that this blue guy is, uh, is, is in such a form. So it has an exponential decay multiplied by a polynomial. And this orange line here represents one, right? So we are crossing one. And of course, when this part of the solution will become uh, the past, so when we are referring to it uh, from, the, from the equation, right here, we need to take some special care because this part will give us the pure exponential decay, right? This, this, will, be, this will just result in some exponential decay from a certain initial value. But when, when this guy enters the regime below one, then we have this uh, increasing of degree of polynomials. Okay. And, and furthermore, maybe the important part is that we have the representation over these intervals of smoothness. So now I have a unique representation for this whole interval, right? So T or S, maybe in this formula S is better. S is running from zero to, I don't know, let's call it tau, right? But when I'm looking at this segment as a segment from the past, I need local time, local coordinates only from the crossing up to the end of the end of the segment. So somehow we need to shift this local representation um, into the into these uh, small sub intervals that arise from crossings. I think it's written here. So how to, how to do this is pretty straightforward, right? We are looking for crossing of something rigorous numerics. So we just apply the interval Newton's method, right? So we can localize the crossings of one within uh, each interval of smoothness, basically. And over this original interval, we have this function, we have this local representation. So basically we are just looking for crossings of one of this very function. Okay, so now let's assume that we have found such a crossing that's somewhere inside the interior of this interval, right? T star, uh, tau star is somewhere inside. So now we can shift this original representation into a new local representation over the second part of this uh, local interval. There are many ways to do it. We could just could have computed it uh, basically 
by hand or what we have opted for it's we just used, used the automatic differentiation to obtain the the coefficients of this polynomial t hat right because if i multiply this function with uh, e to the power of as then i get the polynomial and basically just from differentiation i can obtain uh, its coefficients in local representation All right so uh, finally now we are looking we can we can uh, we can compute consecutive segments of the solution and if we can observe that the solution is staying about one for a longer time interval than one okay, so we are above one exactly as we have started and i'd like to note here that possibly this region when the solution is staying above one is is composed by multiple uh, intervals of smoothness not even full intervals but maybe just parts of intervals of smoothness okay then basically we have uh, verify the existence of a periodic solution, right? Because if originally we started from something that was above one on an interval of length of one, okay, and if we arrive back to such a situation, eventually the function will decay. So eventually it will hit one again, and we are in exactly the same situation as before. We have a, we have a segment of length one, which is above one, and it's touching one exactly at zero. Yeah, so I, we, we can see these uh, situations on, on the pictures. So the initial function is not is not even important. Here we have this exponential decay from zero to one, yeah, and then something else happens. I think I think this is one interval of smoothness here. Okay, and then this is another one, and now we have a decay because because of this part being uh, greater than one. And now I, when I look at this uh, look at this trajectory. I see that the function is staying above one actually for quite long, right? This is, I don't know, this looks like almost 1.5. And it's this interval where the solution is above one, it's actually, it, it, it's com it comprises multiple uh, intervals of smoothness, right? So these are different local representations. But I see that it arrived above one, so eventually it has to touch one because eventually the exponential decay has to kick in. So eventually it will touch one. And from this point, the function has to repeat itself, right? Because the initial condition is basically, or the state of the function, the state in the phase space is basically equivalent to, to what the initial condition was. All right, so this, uh, this non-linearity is, is uh, very forgiving uh, for, uh, for the exact form of the, of the initial condition. It, 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 it's not important what it's doing above one. It just has to be above one uh, for an interval of one. So here we, uh, you see that this is this is a result of our rigorous computation. A was two and B was 15. And we just recall that we need B to be larger than A. And uh, the minimal period of this solution was something around 2.49. Okay, and then we can and, also and so, get sorry and what is the the it looks like it's thick and green what, what does that represent yeah it's uh it's not real uh, how to say it it's not it's not real uncertainty okay i was so basically on this whole interval when you look here we have a local rep representation okay so we know the the coefficients of the polynomial right this polynomial of vt and I just evaluated uh, this representation over consecutive subintervals, and I choose the I've chosen a resol uh, resolution. Okay, so actually the result is is much more precise than uh, than what's what's shown here. But that's just basically function evaluation. Okay, just to give us an idea that something rigorous numerics is happening, so we always have bounds on the values that we are seeing. Does that answer your question? Or yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So now I don't have this uh, green ones. <laughs> uh, this is basically just the center point of all of the intervals. Uh, if, if I zoom in here, we actually see these little boxes. Right, this is a typical picture in rigorous numerics. So these this is just uh, these are just the center points of these uh, intervals connected, and we are in this uh, phase space plot x t and x t minus one. So you can see that there is like a closed curve happening. It's not, it's, it doesn't look so complicated, but maybe the next next example is a bit better. So this is a much more involved uh, periodic solution. You see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 
or 22, I think I missed my counting, around 22 crossings of one. Okay, here again, we have this exponential uh, decay in the very beginning. And then we have these intervals of smoothness. And you know, when, it, when, it's, when it's going above one, then we need to do this shifting of uh, local representation and it has consequences in the future. But eventually, somewhere around here, so I actually written it here, so the minimal period is around 10, 10.1. And that's that's crossing one around 10.1 and we can establish that this this interval here is longer than one that again it implies that the limiting Maclaas equation has a periodic orbit and then this is this is this is not so this doesn't look so trivial and actually when we go to this uh, other kind of plot it looks really complicated okay and basically the message of this uh, of this work uh, that we have done and was largely inspired by Tibor, that uh, we can find complicated looking, yet stable periodic solutions for the Maclaas equation. And maybe just one last example. I don't think this is as complicated as the one before. So now A is 7.0 and B is 10. And now the minimal period is around 19.8. Uh, and you see that sometimes it goes above one. I think this, this might have less intersections with one as well than the previous before, but maybe the, this, this picture is slightly more involved or it looks more involved. But actually what we are looking at is just a stable periodic solution. I think that's where I'm stopping and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ferenc. <clears throat> okay, we have some time for questions or comments. Um, I have a question. So, uh, as you've mentioned, the orbits that you're computing in Mackie Glass Infinity, they, they basically have to be stable. Um, I can't remember if on one of your other slides you said that there was a statement about stability of the orbits for large finite n. Um, was there yeah. a statement about that? Let's go back to that. So we have we have this orbitally asymptotically stable periodic orbits that, that, we, that we can find using this technique. Mm -hmm. It's not any periodic orbit, okay? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering about, I mean, theoretically, with the, um, with the, with the n large, um, is the stability for n large of those periodic orbits coming from your, um, I think it was probably your result on the previous slide, where you can sort of compare, um, yeah, was it coming from this theorem or was it some other kind of like spectral flow result or something like this? Well, it somehow originates from this one, but uh, okay. there are several steps here, which I, you know, they are, I would say they are rather involved for presenting mm -hmm. that online. And I, I really hope that, uh, you know, that we are writing this down and, and we made good progress. So I yeah. really think that shortly you can read it actually. Okay. And then it will clear. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, but I think that the reason is quite simple. I mean, for stability. Uh, the, the reason is that if, so the, the equation is not sensitive for a segment which is above one, because if x t minus one is above one, then f of x t minus one is zero. So no matter how you choose that segment, you get the same value for the derivative. So this, this means that you can, uh, uh, well, this allows uh, uh, well, a, free, a much, much freedom to change the initial function. This, this, uh, somehow this guarantees the stability, at least for the limiting equation. And uh, that can be preserved for, the, for large n. So that's I, as, as, as I see. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, uh, Tibor, for the clarification. I believe that Piotr Skijinski has a question. Piotr? Sorry. But so this theorem about this approximation, it was previous slide, or I don't know. This week. This one? Yes, yes. So it's for this, it doesn't matter whether it's 
say how many times it crosses, right? I mean, this is general statement. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, this, this is a this is a general statement, and it's and it, basically it's somehow it's a constructive statement. So, but you know, it'd be much longer. So actually, we could write here what the value exactly as Tibor said. We could write here what the value of b is. So we could we can construct that. Um, okay, so, so this figure doesn't make sense to to put it on the picture. This is already too. <laughs> No, 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 no. So, so the, the argument about this asymptotic stability is uh, not really depending on this, but on what Tibor said, right? More or less, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Aha, so you're saying that if you get this kind of fixed point with function above one, it should be more or less asymptotically stable. This was the argument. Because yeah, yeah. Aha, mm -hmm. okay. But uh huh. But is it? Can I treat kind of this discontinuity like a one car section or or not? Does it make sense to tell like some yeah, like something like this? So actually, actually, the way we establish the connection between periodic solutions of the original equation and the and the limiting equation, we are using the return map. We are using one car uh -huh. sections to establish, and then we should, we have to show that that's a construction. Uh, sorry. What's that? It's a contraction, and then and then we will establish uh, existence of periodic solutions. And so that that of course that's happening in the background. Yes, but the, the theorem. But in a sense, for for your fixed points, you have like you somehow know how many I don't know segments you have, and you show that it's mapped into itself, right? So you have like your function has a structure. And somehow, right? So because uh, yeah, yeah something, something like that. So we, we are shift we are shifting the solutions uh, to appropriate um, to appropriate segments when we can yeah so something like something like what you said. Yeah, yeah. So this is like Brouwer in the space of those functions with that structure, more or less, right? I, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. But then, okay, and then Z attractors. There should be definitely some a lot of unstable orbitals, though, right? And, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so the, the statement yeah. here in this work is only about these uh, stable periodic orbits of a special kind, right? This is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are stable because you 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 look in for those who are positive, let's uh, bigger than one, let's say, and then yeah, yeah, more or less, right? Okay. Yeah, and that's also obvious from the from the figures from rigorous as a result of rigorous numerics that this is really a stable uh, phenomenon, right? Going above one, it's like it's really. It's really not sensitive for the initial function. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you have a guess? Okay, so what you, then you would like to know more or less what n it is, okay? So how far your orbit extends. So can you guess at least a number? Like I don't I don't have I don't have any guesses. Maybe Tibor has. I, I don't have a guess on n and then being large. No, I think it 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 can be estimated. So you, it's the proof is constructive in in this sense. So you can get a bound, and uh, I have checked numerically these stable periodic orbits, and it turned out that you can, well, n can be much smaller than than the theorem says. So so you you can. Come down with n such that the the, the obtained uh, periodic orbit remains still there and and it's still stable. But well, there is no; it's only a numerical mm -hmm. result. But but for large n, we can prove it. And also, there is another interesting case when b is close to a. Then it always works. That uh, and then the period. If b tends to a, then the period tends to infinity. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a very simple uh, periodic orbit, but it's interesting that the, then the period tends to infinity. I, I don't have a picture of that, but basically what, ha what happens. But that, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's not a numerical result, because that would require a, a integration on a very long interval. It's, it's, it's an analytic result. Yeah, in the case of limiting case, right? When b goes to a. Yes. Right? Yeah. If b is close to a, then we have a very, very simple looking periodic orbit with large period. Mm -hmm. 
but isn't it because the equilibrium, the non-trivial equilibrium tends to zero? Uh, because the non-equilibrium, isn't it B divided by A square root of B divided by A minus one? No, no, no the reason is not that, but the reason is that then the, essentially you just deal with the, the linear delay differential equation where A is, a B is close to A. So, and if B is A, then you have constant solutions. So this E to the minus A T on the interval zero one goes to one very slowly and essentially almost monotonically. Mm -hmm. So that's, and it, it gives a very simple uh, solution. Okay, uh, Ferenc, there is a question in the chat do you want me do you want to read it or I, you want I, me to i managed to open the chat All right so how big is the order of uh, of the of the polynomial in these examples it was not it was not extremely large it was like five six i think seven was the largest that i've seen over the over the orbits that we looked at uh, i don't know if i you can hear me i can hear you Okay, so uh, because uh, basically the, this method uh, like rises the order uh, each time you like uh, doing the integration over one delay, yes or, or not uh, of the representation or you, you are like have some implementation of I don't know tail or something. No, no, no. So, so the, the so the point here is that these these are exact representations of the of the solution, so we don't need this. Uh, Taylor representation ah, remain their term. Okay. It's, and yeah, it's the, very... the order 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 is is uh, is getting larger and larger. But you know when mm -hmm. when the solution eventually uh, goes above one, even you can see mm -hmm. on this picture just for uh, mm -hmm. short mm -hmm. uh, periods, then you know this procedure resets. So uh, okay. Mm -hmm. above one, we just we just go back to order zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in, in sense, you are not computing like Poincaré map, but uh, just. Uh, going or maybe uh, you, you stop when you reach this region where you are uh, above one for long enough time yes yeah yeah so uh -huh. yeah, that's what happens but basically and, yeah, and so then uh, okay and there the, the, in the vicinity there is some uh, some initial condition which is uh, the true solution yes because uh, I understand that this is not the true solution. This is kind of like a very close uh, numerical solution. Yes, or, 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 or I, I am wrong. So this is this is this picture. Maybe like that one with the one with, with less less green ones. So so what you see here after after two point mm -hmm. five ish, right? This segment here mm -hmm. is is uh, is containing the sets of boxes. Ah, oh, okay. Solutions. The two solutions. Okay. Ah. Okay. 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 Uh, as, as a value. Yes. 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 Okay. 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 Thank you. Other questions. So I actually have I have uh, so for this very specific uh, periodic orbit that you're showing right now. So could you tell us what B and M are? For this one, <laughs> no, no. So, so basically, what you know, like, so the rigorous computation is, is somehow detached from uh, from the theoretical part, establishing the connection between the the original Maxwell's equation and the limiting equation. So, when when we when uh, we were writing, or I was writing the, the the code for this computation, you know, that that part is is distant. <laughs> now we know that there is a connection. There are some certain constants. Uh, I never really okay. compute. Well, I, it would be interesting to see that. Okay, anyway, because I, 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 I agree that it, it could be interesting to check. Uh, and also, did you, you do the exercise of taking that orbit and then taking very large n and I don't know, plugging that into some sort of Newton solver to see if I mean if that converges for large n? Yeah. So, oh, so these parameter pairs that uh, I'm showing, and actually we have we have quite a few more, they are coming from non-rigorous uh, experiments, right? So this is basically a, a verification of, of something that we observed numerically for some large M. Okay. And this is just verifying those. Okay. 
so uh, that, and, and of course, the dynamics can be much more involved. So the, we are looking, we are actually looking at some parameter values and some specific, uh, bit similar but, uh, but periodic, uh, with similar periodic solutions that are unstable. And you know, so everything comes from non-rigorous observations, and uh, this is a verification procedure. Okay, and and what about, um, I mean, your plans for proof of chaos in this uh, in this limiting case? I mean, I, I remember being in Seget. Uh, maybe a year, year and something ago, and, and I was talking to Gabriela Vaz and she was talking about this project of trying to prove chaos in the limiting case where you have this n go equals infinity. So what's, what's the status of that? Are you, are you guys have IDAs or trying to prove that's connection? That, that's that's what we are working on right now. And uh, Gabriela had a really nice uh, idea on how to capture a certain class of uh, unstable periodic orbits like you know we are doing rigorous numerics so so you always need to discretize and then and then conquer the problem and and she found a really nice uh, way to reduce like these are infinite dimensional problems i haven't mentioned that but right somehow in, in order to capture them with computer we need to reduce the dimension into something finite and she found a really nice projection uh that is i think three dimensional projection of uh, of uh, unstable periodic solutions of a certain kind and we are hoping we have, we actually can like we can prove that those solutions exist and then we can we can do quite a lot by now but we are still working on that but the final goal is to establish a, a homoclinic orbit to those mm -hmm. unstable periodic solutions yes okay thanks uh, are there any other questions or comments No? Well, in that case, um, I would like to thank you again, Ferenc, for a great talk. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Uh, this is a difficult equation to, to uh, and especially being at, uh, at McGill with Mackie and Glass around the corner. It's, uh, it's quite interesting to, uh, to realize how, I mean, how hard this is, this, this has been, this, uh, this route to understand the dynamics of the Mackie glass equation and there are still many open questions. So hopefully one day we'll have all the answers. All right, so thanks a lot once again. And the next week we will have uh, Gianni Arioli. He will be talking, I think about Navier Stokes. So hopefully see you there. And once again, Sferenc, thank you very much and see you next week, guys. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.